if you have a moment. Yep, continue. All righty. Um, we're going to give it a few minutes to kick started. Um, if whoever's on the line right now, if you could just let us know in the chat uh, that you can hear us loud and clear, that would be great. We're just going to give it a couple minutes before we get started. Excellent. So we're getting a couple of thumbs up. Thanks for thanks for letting us know, Peter. And also, we'd we'd love to know where you guys are calling in from. Uh, we're going to have quite a few people along today, so we're really excited to get into this exclusive webinar brought to you by Raygun and GitHub. I've got Sam Hunt, the VP of APAC at GitHub, along with Nick Harley, Director of Product. Uh, they're going to at Raygun. They're really excited to share, you know, their expertise on this topic. We've also got Eliza. From, a, uh, from GitHub as well. Um, so we're all here in the Wellington HQ at Raygun, uh, getting excited for this discussion. So we're gonna give it a couple more minutes. Um, happy to hear that everyone can hear us. Also, we really want this to be a uh, discussion format. Um, so any questions you guys have, would love you to put them in the Q&A section of Zoom. Um, so please, as we kind of work through some of the slides and some of the discussion points, if you have any questions at all, please add those to the Q&A uh, we're going to leave plenty of time at the end of this presentation to, to go through those questions. Alrighty, we've got people streaming in. We're just going to give it one more minute and uh, we'll, we'll get into this thing. You guys looking forward to it? Yeah, I'm excited. Are excited? <laughs> are we, we going to tell the story? We should I'm tell the story. I think it's an awesome story. Yeah, look, yeah, okay, we've got a minute. Um, speed and reliability. <laughs> Uh, we, we are running this out of Wellington at the Raygun HQ. We've got our friends at GitHub coming over from APAC to join us. We set this for Brisbane time zone. So we were actually all here ready to go one hour ago, um, but Queensland doesn't have a daylight savings. Um, so we've had to kick back for our extra, extra hour. Um, we adapted pretty quick. Um, our friends here at GitHub had a plane to catch you know, very shortly, but they've rebooked that. So. Um, so yeah, that's a bit of a wooden spoon for me, the organizer, um, but we adapted quickly, eh guys? <laughs> it, was, it was all staged to show how shipping fast is not just applicable to code. <laughs> it's a mentality, right? And we'll get to that, ain't it? That's it. Yeah, I mean, I think we dealt with it pretty well, um, but looking forward to getting into it. You're pretty calm, Matt. Yeah. Alrighty, so yeah, I think that's it. We've got plenty of people on the line. Let's, let's crack into it. So this exclusive webinar brought to you by Raygun and GitHub, we're going to talk about speed and reliability. So how to move fast and fix things. Uh, really looking forward to hearing from Sam and Nick about both their kind of unique perspectives on this topic. Um, let's run through the agenda very quick. Um, I'm going to introduce these two and hand it over to those guys shortly. Uh, they're going to run really quickly over what is Raygun and what is GitHub for those that are unaware. Um, and then we're going to jump into the discussion part of this, this topic. Uh, once again, we've got the Q&A section in Zoom. So if you have any questions, please throw them in there. We're going to give plenty of time for the Q&A. So we'll move through the slides and then we'll move to the Q&A. We also have some prizes, don't we, Eliza? Sure do. Mega swag pack. Yeah, all the swag you can imagine. <laughs> so if you have questions, we're going to pick the best question or two and we'll send uh, those best questions, the person who asked them some swag from Raygun and GitHub. But first, I do have a quick poll. Um, and this is kind of just to get a little bit of information about you guys um, so we can kind of tailor the conversation around where you are at in the journey. So let me launch that poll right now. Um, everyone can see that. So the first question is how many developers are there at your organization? We've got a multiple choice option there. Um, how often does your team ship code into production? That's quite an interesting one. Um, and then how much time does your team spend on bugs and performance issues? Uh, just, you know, you're not going to know that exactly, but roughly how many, how much time does your team spend on bugs and performance issues? So I'm seeing the results fly in right now. So guys, we've got 30% oh, have got between 11 and 50 on their development teams, 45% between 1 and 10. Um, most people are shipping code weekly, which is pretty good. We've got 30% multiple times per day. Um, and then people are spending 10 to 25% mostly on uh, fixing and spending time on bugs and performance issues. Maybe I can kind of share results with you guys just very quickly. Should be able to see that now. Yeah, we can see that. Excellent. So that's, that's pretty interesting. Uh, we've got a bit of a mix here. 
Um, smaller teams between one and 10 or actually up to 50 make up, you know, 70% of the audience today. But we've got you know, almost 20% with a hundred or more. So that's pretty cool. Um, multiple times per day, a third of the third of our audience are, are shipping multiple times per day. That's definitely where things are heading. Um, and then 50% weekly. So that's, that's pretty, pretty good going as well. It wasn't long, long ago where it was far less regular than that. Um, and then, yeah, a vast majority are spending between 10 and 25% on bugs. So we we'll appreciate that. Alrighty, so let's move on from that and uh, meet the presenters. We've got Sam Hunt, the VP of APAC at GitHub, and Nick Harley, the Director of Product, also dabbles in a bit of marketing from Raygun. Guys, I'll hand it over to you guys. Take it away. Sam, you want to kick it off? Cool, yeah. Thanks for the intro. Uh, Sam Hunt, I, uh, I run the APAC region for GitHub, uh, working with customers' community on delivering the world's largest uh, code development platform, collaboration platform. And I'm Nick. Uh, I'm the director of product, so my job's more or less connecting with customers and finding out what we what we need to build, how we need to build it, uh, and then wrangling developers and design teams to to try and get those through the pipe as soon as possible. Excellent. And Nick, what what's, what is Raygun? Yeah, so Raygun offers a suite of products that monitor your web and mobile applications. Um, and then when errors, crashes, and performance issues affect users, uh, we give developers all the diagnostic details they need to kind of fix them with greater speed and accuracy. So over to you, Nick. I mean, Sam. Yeah, so I mean, for those that don't know GitHub, as I mentioned, it's, it's the world's largest uh, developer collaboration and code management platform. It's where most of the world's open source code lives. There's 41 million developers collaborating on a daily basis on GitHub. Uh, but it's also uh, an extension into commercial collaboration around code as well. So open source is extremely relevant to everybody's uh, development ecosystem, but it's not everything we do is open source. We provide an extension, which is the same tool for your com commercial collaboration and development as well. Awesome. Speed and reliability, how to move fast and fix things is, is why we're all here today. Uh, we'll start off with mentality and culture, Nick. Yeah, so, so this is quite an, an important point to kind of get across. Um, the actual inspiration for this uh, webinar title were, kind of came from Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook. And Facebook's a massive organization, as we know, and we shouldn't all go out and copy uh, exactly what Facebook's doing. But this kind of move fast and break things was a, a motto and a mantra that Facebook had uh, throughout their offices several years ago. And it got picked up in the press and lots of people kind of quote it because it's, it is quite kind of catchy. Um, but a lot of people don't realize that this actually got superseded not, not long afterwards. Um, and a quote here from um, Mark Zuckerberg at the uh, Facebook developers um, conference said that the idea here is that developers moving quickly is so important that we are even willing to tolerate a few bugs in order to do that. What we realized over time is that it wasn't helping us to move faster because we had to slow down to fix these bugs and it wasn't improving our speed. So they actually pulled back from this move fast and break things to actually go with this less, less catchy move fast with stable infrastructure type model. And if Facebook um, with all their resources and money and such a big company can't actually pull off moving fast um, and fixing things, um, it's, it kind of points to more of this problem. Like, you know, I think, Facebook in the early days could get away with it because the, the company's on a rapid growth trajectory and um, it's just it's just way better for developers to actually fix things as they go along. Um, and every company now is becoming a software company. So what do all these companies have in common? Well, they're all not, they didn't start out as software companies. They've had to grow into software and better monitoring and application performance is kind of a core aspect of what they do nowadays because high street retailers have mobile apps, websites to manage, stock ordering systems, even places like Home Depot, um, you can now order online. They're now an online first company. And if we don't have good software experiences, people are just gonna shop next door. And so right in the middle there, Domino's Pizza. I mean, they're a pizza company, retail, but if we actually look at their share price over time, they're just, if you use technology, if you've ever seen Domino's Pizza and what they come out with, with pizza trackers, there's a pizza checker thing being advertised at the moment. 
Hmm. And if or if all of this technology didn't actually work very well for users, um, then this share price would look a lot a lot different. So developers are actually in this unique position at the moment where the the faster they can build is actually a market opportunity and a business outcome that developers are actually empowering these companies to do well. It's interesting. It's interesting yeah. that the developers are in the center of this, aren't they? The center of innovation for non-technical, traditionally non-technical companies. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Nick, just just to extend on one of your examples, um, look at the automotive industry. And we all we all consume cars at some point in our lives, or most of us do. And uh, you know, from from where the car industry competed 10 to 15 years ago, it was around colors and, and, you know, wheel sizes and speed and gearboxes. And the reality is most of us go out and buy a car based on the technology that's going into it. So there's an industry that's completely shit, still, still very connected to its roots of being a manufacturing industry, but it's completely shifted to how it competes to being a technology industry as well. Cool. And if we move on to the mentality within the team over monitoring, um, it doesn't really matter whether you've got a new relic, a ray gun, a Dynatrace, whatever tool you're using to monitor your software. You can buy a tool, but it won't actually do anything for your team if you don't use it correctly or have um, the team culture around monitoring the software quality. So when you are moving fast, you can actually spot issues and fix them as you go along. Just buying a tool is really irrelevant unless you use it properly. And a lot of the mistakes that we see with the development teams is they talk a lot about, oh, how many errors does my application have? You know, how many problems does our application, our software, our infrastructure? It's very kind of internally focused. Um, and we really need to break out of this kind of like, it's about our application and our software and our code, because it's really not. The, out, the outcomes are that it's affecting your customers and your end user experience and your conversion rates and the revenue of the business. And these are all outcomes, you know, the, the things in the middle are all tactics. You can choose what to monitor. You can choose which parts of your application that you need to pay attention to, but the outcomes are about your customers and who really actually cares the most about these outcomes. It's usually the CEO, the senior management, the executive team, the head of product, all the people uh, in your organization that are more senior, um, and you want to impress, care about these outcomes. So when we're actually looking at being able to communicate these things within our teams, it's best to focus on these outcomes. It's like the biggest career hack you can have just to take what you're doing at the code level and then talk about them more in an outcome level and how it affects the business. Um, one of the key measures that I look for in the team um, when I ask engineers, is do they actually look forward to shipping new features or does it kind of fill them with this sense of dread? Like, you know, oh, if we push this live, it's gonna actually go wrong and, and there's no real safety net. So if you can actually get your team to think about this, do, I, do we have confidence in shipping um, what we've built? Have we got the monitoring in place to make sure if it does go wrong and we can pull it back? That's that's kind of the, the litmus test of, have we actually got this culture and this team mentality? Um, to the right place and deploying with confidence really comes from like how will we actually deploy code safely as a team and how can we increase the frequency to several times a day and continuous integration and continuous deployment are essential for kind of quick development cycles so this is kind of the first step we need to get to um, on the poll there you know people are at kind of mostly weekly deployments but is there an appetite in the business to make that daily um, or even improve it just from where you are. And if you can get there, things like code reviews, pair programming, bug bash Fridays, all these types of things can actually help you get um, your software quality improved and the speed that you are shipping software can improve as well. And if we put deployment and release tracking around issues, um, we can actually ship with confidence because we know that we're going to catch them once they go out in, into production. So gone are the days where we used to have all our, um, all our kind of changes rolled up in one big release and we release it on the shipping day and everyone get really nervous around it. If we can actually in, increase the frequency that we ship, we'll actually see that have huge benefits across the business because things are going out in smaller pieces. 
Nick, can I just, I, I, I really like this and I think it's key and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this. I'm obviously not so much from the technical side, but more from the, from the culture side. But um, this is really, um, really draws to the point that tools are part of your team and getting the feedback from them in context of what you're trying to deliver as an outcome based on your previous slide is a really, really important part of trusting that whole ecosystem that's delivering. I mean, the reality of the reason why we can deliver so much code now is because we're able to trust and automate with the great tools that we use, the parts that it just become the bog down of your day to day. And I think it's a really important point. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. You know, um, it has to start with your team and your culture and the mentality you have around this stuff. So how can you actually improve from where you are today to ship faster and with better quality? And you're kind of comparing your team to the best in the world these days with the kind of, you know, people's expectations and uh, that of Netflix or Slack. Yeah. <laughs> and so you've kind of got to be looking at the best in the world and, and, and kind of moving towards that direction or being part of that journey, which is changing so quickly. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I read something a while ago around Amazon shipping multiple times a day, you know, hundreds of times, hundreds of times. Um, but I thought I'd include this uh, example of how we do it at Raygun, just to give people a perspective of, of our, and we could always do better, obviously, but we, we feel as though we've got quite a good process going on in this area. And so we use Jira for our issue tracking and prioritizing work. And then once that goes into the dev team, they use their own kind of tooling. You know, we don't we don't have too many kind of uh, restrictions on, on what they use, but uh, things like Rider and Visual Visual Studio um, are pretty prevalent within our team. And then we use GitHub to manage our source code. And when people commit their code, we run automated continuous integration builds, um, which will fail if uh, there's a problem in the application and people can fix. Um, and then we use Octopus Deploy to actually deploy our code to beta environments, test environments, and promote it to production when it's ready. Um, but while it's on the beta environment um, and the integration tests have passed, uh, we all get other people on the team to code review everything that will go out the door. And if changes are need to make, we'll go through that process again. But, it, but if it's okay, we'll merge that into the master um, run that through the build again and then we obviously put it into production and we have Raygun watching for uh, alerts we tag the deployments with the um with Raygun there's a deployment tracking functionality so you can actually um see which issues you've introduced and we have that hooked up to slack as well so we know if we were to ship something to production if we start getting errors in our slack channel then we know we can roll it back pretty quickly uh, but Hopefully that doesn't happen because of the, the QA and the integration tests and the safety nets that have been put in place. And then as we do have uh, issues in production because um, nobody's perfect, um, we can, um, well, we can, we can deploy pretty easily and we can roll back pretty easily. So with Octopus Deploy, we we'll usually run it on one of the office environments and then promote it into a beta, which is um, as close to production as possible before promoting it to production. So we're actually in this situation where we can roll back deployments um, within seconds and we can ship to production within around five minutes. The, the biggest thing that takes the most amount of time is actually the build set uh, in that process to actually build the code. And if, um, if people are looking to get a bit more information on this, Ollie on our team is on our dev team and can probably speak to it more than me um, at this bit.ly link at the bottom. Um, there's a blog post there that goes into detail about how we actually ship ship software like this. And so the last point on this uh, culture section is you've signed up to this webinar because you have an interest in actually uh, moving faster and fixing things that go along. But you really need to kind of stand out in your organization and actually make this happen. Um, so I've spoken to multiple people who have actually had success with driving this culture within their team. And they always feel like um, they were they were a little bit going out on a limb initially. Um, they, they felt like they didn't have the buy-in. But when they spoke about these business outcomes and they tied it all back to um, outcome-based approaches, they actually got the buy-in of the executive team and we were able to kind of um, accelerate their own career as well as improve the, um, the organization um, in their engineering team. Because they stuck in the neck out and say, hey, well, I'm not comfortable with what we're doing right now. We can do better. Um, so I think, you know, it, 
it is going to accelerate your career and get you more respect if you just try and do this continuous improvement in, in your team. Um, and the end result is better software for your customers. So there's, there's no real downside to wanting to improve software velocity and quality at the same time. Yeah. Um, so I think sort of extending on that from the culture perspective, which is really where my expertise more comes into it than the technology side of things. Uh, we, there's, there's really three key areas that we want to focus on in this. And, and the first one, um, we'll, we'll cover them off. They all have slightly different tangents, but the first one is really getting over the, um, the fear factor around your work. And that's where you know, there's relevance around, around how tools can help you do that, but also how people can help you do that as well. But the, the work without fear is, is shifting as well, and it means different things to different people. Um, you can see on your, on your screen right now, you see a line. That line kind of, for, for me, that's the 20, 20th century. That's the CEO of an organisation. They work without fear. They own the risk and they make decisions. But the reality of the 21st century is we're not lions. Um, <laughs> We're honey badgers, right? Honey badgers work without fear. We have to be in there. We have to be aggressive. And there's two things that really help us do that. One is, is to be comfortable with having lots of eyes on things and collaborating on our mistakes and our wins as well. And the other is relying on tools. Um, and this is a great shift in the way that businesses see the value of technology as well. So that, that line's still there, but that line now respects what the honey badger means to, to their organization because uh, let's face it, we talked about every company being a technology company a little earlier. Uh, it, it couldn't be truer and, and this the importance of what you're doing at a development level resonates all the way up. Um, so if we, uh, if, if we take that, how do we, how, do we, uh, how do we make that relevant? It's around collaboration. So we talk about collaboration within our own, uh, our own developer community and our own teams, but it's also collaboration with the business. It's really, really important. And as I said before, collaboration with tools, tools are part of your business as well. So the relevance to the information that they're giving back to you has to be taken in the same way that you would take feedback from a colleague that might be doing a code review or you've asked a question for. And it's all about how those pieces collaborate together to bring outcomes that are in line with what we're all trying to achieve. Now, here's the hard bit. We're all trying to achieve a little different things. Um, so if we, go, if we go and look at what a developer wants, well, the reality is they kind of want chaos. They want to try a lot of things. They want to play. They want to come out with innovative outcomes. Um, but business don't always want that, right? They want, they want some control there. They want to mitigate risk and make sure that there's some sort of boundaries. So this is, this is where we talk about finding a balance between, um, between your control and your chaos. And you, know, you see the railroad tracks on the screen. It's kind of like the business owns one side and technology owns the other. And you need to collaborate and come to agreement on where your rails sit and how wide they are or how narrow they are. Now, the downside is you can get really, really tight on the control, but that narrows your ability to innovate and ship at speed. And then there's a downside to being really, really open because you lose a lot of the control. The interesting fact is it's usually your consumer or your industry that's going to dictate where those rails should be. So the, the, the natural balance here is where you have the rails in a position where you can compete and stay up to date with what the market's asking you to do. So I'd ask yourself to take a step back and look, if you feel like you're falling behind your competitors or your industry demand, your rails are probably too close. If you feel like you have trust issues with your consumer because of product stability or inconsistencies, your rails are probably too wide. And it's really, really important pulling it back into the collaboration piece because um, we haven't always been good at having business talk to technology and coming out with aligned outcomes. And that's what's going to help us succeed. It's not just a developer decision. It's not just a business decision. It's a company decision for outcomes. And remembering that those outcomes, you have measurables in the market where you can figure out What's, what's important? What am I missing at? It's, it's not hard to do. Tools like Raygun 
um, they really give you an opportunity to have another insight. And it gives you, in addition to that, it gives you great insight at speed as well. And that's, that's the important thing. So I think if we can focus on those three points, working without fear, um, and then, you know, again, that can mean a lot of things. It could be um, fear of criticism is one that I actually hear a lot. Developers being worried that somebody's going to put eyes on their code and criticize it. Be conscious of how you criticize, be constructive in how you criticize, because really you want that. It's how we all improve better by getting constructive criticism back. And, and it is a cultural shift away to be comfortable with that. Um, that ties into the collaboration. So really, really important that collaboration is a key part of our strategy moving forward. And again, as I said, it's not just collaboration within ourselves, it's collaboration within our industry, it's collaboration with, um, within open source communities. We're probably all leveraging open source technology uh, that, that helps us deliver because we don't want to reinvent the wheel. And then the last one is identifying the boundaries and those rails and how we're going to work closely together with aligned outcomes that are going to allow us to, to develop at the speed that we have to, to either compete or stay relevant. It's some health, healthy um, kind of conflict there, isn't it? Between, you know, business objectives and being safe to what basically your customer demands is, is fast innovation. It really not bright, not, you know, not affecting the performance or the experience. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think people forget that, um, your product's being consumed by something, someone, you know, and it's, it's what they think of it as much as anything else. And, you know, if we've got, if we look at, if we look at disruptors, so the Airbnbs, the Ubers, the Netflix of the world, they changed industries. And if you didn't stay relevant, you disappeared. They've changed industries, but they've also changed our expectations. Yeah. I know a lot of governments are finding it really difficult because, the way that they operate doesn't really allow, but we expect apps to be able to, you know, change deeds on houses and things like that now. So mm -hmm. consumer expectations have certainly shifted. Yeah, I actually was talk I was on a panel in Sydney yesterday. I was talking to, to Eliza about this earlier. Uh, just before I went on the panel, my daughter emailed me from her science class asking me to send her a design for a mousetrap car, <laughs> right? Her expectation is that I'm available right now. Assume that your consumer is in the exact same position. It's, I mean, it's rapid, it's changing so, so quickly, mm -hmm. you know, that's, it's constantly moving. Yeah. So we, we talked a lot about kind of technology and teams, but how do you, how do you actually get the buy-in to some of this stuff? Um, and for me, I'm a personal uh, fan of dashboards because um, having dashboards up in the office, um, it's just really powerful. People know what's going on, things like that. But what I've um, encountered across multiple companies is, the dashboards just show the success metrics. How many sales did we make? How many goal completions did we have? Things like that. But it takes a very long time for those metrics to start sagging before anybody notices, oh, there's actually something going on under the hood here. So I'm a big believer in having really raw metrics of like, you know, tell me when this stuff is broken on the dashboard in the office. Um, and what does, it, what, what does your team actually need to pay attention to? So have this discussion with your team. What do we need to monitor? Um, we actually have this concept of canaries here at Reagan where, you know, we have these kind of uh, these signals like, you know, on, you know, nobody can pay, nobody can do this and that. And thankfully these canaries don't go off very often, but we've got them there to tell us straight away uh, when something's broken. So how can you put up dashboards in your office that can kind of tell you, uh, when things are going wrong so that somebody doesn't have to go a month later and go, why are sales down so much this month? And you have a checkout issue or something like that. Yeah. Again, it comes back to tools being part of the team. Yep. It's really, really important. And they're providing you valuable context to your business. Absolutely. And I will say sitting here in the ray gun office, they certainly walk the walk. There's lots of fun things to yep. look at around <laughs> in the walls. Um, and that, that visibility is actually appreciated by other people in the business. So, you know, um, when, when, when other people are, are walking around, they're kind of, they're seeing that the engineering team are, are using these dashboards and they're kind of, they're, they're kind of assured that people are on top of this stuff, like they're watching it. Um, and so marketing of, you know, have their own dashboards of their own metrics, but in your engineering team, can you, can you, put these dashboards up to give your business visibility that 
the engineering team are trusted. Um, they're on top of it. They know if things are going to go wrong. And that, that'll actually give you far more kind of um, trust and validation from the people um, within your organization. Um, and what, what should you be really measuring? Uh, because cycle times and points completed and sprints completed and all these types of things, they're all productivity metrics. And so they're quite prevalent in engineering teams, but they don't, they talk about, you know, the, the amount of work done rather than the quality of the work done. And we actually have um, turned off our net promoter score system recently because it just wasn't giving us good valuable insights. But that's another thing that people use to kind of try and measure um, whether they're being effective in the market, but um, better kind of metrics to even put into this mix. So kind of how many, how many errors does our application have? How many bugs have we introduced? How many users have been affected by bugs? Um, have we got slow performance? You know, how slow is too slow? So if our checkout page takes three seconds to load, is that, is that acceptable to us? Um, what is an acceptable load speed and can we put measures in to actually alert us when these um, these problems arise and can we report on them over time? How can we improve? Also, another thing we watch here at Raygun is, you know, how many, how many technical support tickets for issues that users experience are coming in each day? Um, can we actually get that down? Because um, any day where we get zero support tickets is going to be a great day and it's going to save the business a, a hell of a lot of money. Um, and also there's, there's kind of, um, there's two ways to look at this. I mean, if, if you're kind of singling out people that are introducing issues or fixing issues, you shouldn't use it as a, as a stick to kind of, uh, embarrass people, or beat people up, um, on the fact they're introducing issues, but it can be a measure to kind of say, you know, does this person need some help? You know, that are they, are we teaching them properly or we, can we pair them up with somebody else? Um, but also rewarding people are fixing the most issues as well. Um, and that positive reinforcement about we care about software quality um, and singling out people for stuff they've done that had a big impact on the business. Yeah, and Nick, I don't know whether this is relevant. I'm just, you know, overstepping my boundaries as a technologist or not, but that person that's introducing issues might actually be identifying something that was downstream that could yep. be fixed. Yep. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the amount of times you'll find an error, but it's connected in some way to yeah. another error. Um, but again, you know, if you're fixing things that the, that has a business impact, you know, if it's a customer facing bug that you fix and no, no longer do 50 people a week encounter something that's going to get the attention of the people above you and the product person. And, and you're going to get recognized for that, that type of work. Um, and you might, you might run into people who, who view it. I'm, I'm in the product team, right? So I was running into engineers and go, oh, yeah, yeah, but we need to do this, um, this piece of technical debt, right? And it's always a fight between product roadmap, infrastructure roadmap, fixing technical debt. So reframing technical debt um, can really get you more buy-in. Um, you don't really want to be kind of saying to the product, yeah, yeah, uh, well, but we, we need to add a new node to our Elasticsearch cluster and um, make some critical maintenance on our SQL server data. Like for a non-technical person, they don't understand that. They're just not going to get buy-in. So you, you, your kind of technical debt is going to get right down the roadmap. So four kind of things to try and tie technical debt back is kind of, does it actually help with performance? Does it help with reliability? Does it help with um, scaling? And does it help with security? And if, if you go to the, the product manager or whoever runs your roadmap and you say, look, um, if we don't do this, we're going to run into scaling issues. We can't onboard new users. Uh, we, we're going to run into these performance issues and tie it back to these four things. You're going to speak in a language that they can't say no to. So your technical debt priorities are going to get way more buy-in rather than talking them to them. Like we said earlier, talking about your application and your code and all mm -hmm. that, speak about it in customer outcomes and benefits to the business and you'll instantly overnight get way more buy-in on, on technical debt issues. Yeah, and I think remembering that technology only owns one side of the rails. So if it makes a lot of sense um, to both sides, it's gonna get your result much faster. Yeah, we actually, we prioritize our roadmap product and infrastructure together. So we can have a conversation together around like, does this make sense to do this before this? And it could be a technical dead item that engineering want to kind of um, complete. 
and they might say, well, we need to do that piece of work on the database before we can actually do this other piece of work. So, so try and roll them up and don't have them as separate roadmaps. Um, and another stuff, uh, another thing you might run into is people say, oh, I just don't have time. You know, I'm so busy trying to ship these product features and um, there's a deadline to meet. But actually making time for software quality doesn't have to be that time intensive. So um, one thing we've found with our, our more enterprise customers that um, they seem to resonate with is, is in, in Raygun, the, the errors get picked up. And if we just rank these by how many users are affected and then take the top two items and include them in each sprint, it's a super easy way to just be chipping away at software quality over time. And if you just use the highest, highest impact errors or issues or performance problems you can actually fix and then put those one or two in every sprint, you'll actually make a big dent um, in your software quality over six months to a year. So just to recap, um, talked about mentality and culture to, to get your team on board with actually improving systems and processes to actually be able to move fast and fix things at the same time and not, not break as much. We also talked about like how do you personally invoke the change in your organization? How are you going to actually make improvements and get the buy-in? So talk about those outcomes to your leadership team and your managers and your product person and speak it, speak to it in the business metrics and the impact for customers and stuff like that. And then Sam talked about modern teams, obviously the honey badger reference. Um, <laughs> do you want to recap? Not the rugby player. No. But, uh... <laughs> No, I just, I just think it's, it's that, that work without fear and it ties into better collaboration as well. The other point I didn't cover off, but I'd like to cover is when you collaborate and share and track and keep this information, it's all useful. It all helps you speed up your business because you can not only look at, it's not your product that's, that's morphing and transforming and getting better or getting different or whatever or more relevant. It's also the decisions that are driving that, that you can now learn from and use as experience when you hit another fork down the road. And if you, if you don't do that, you're missing an opportunity to help. Again, tools, people, information, these are the things that are going to drive good decisions about our product and our go-to-market. You build that muscle memory, don't you? Yep. But for teams who kind of constantly change and, and kind of incorporate new ways of doing things, they, they're already ahead of the pack because they're doing it. They're building that muscle, muscle memory. Yep. They're learning. Um, and it, you know, it, it turns into a distinct competitive advantage. Yeah. And it could be as simple as, oh, we made this decision. Uh, you know, we, we, we're weighing up something new in a, in, a, in a new market or demographic that we're maybe targeting. And we're going down a certain path. And somebody might say, well, actually, we, we looked at that. It's very similar to this scenario two years ago. And in fact, what we found was this was a much better way forward for us. And we're able to do it really fast. And then... To the second point, or to, or, or to extend on that, reusability of what you wrote back then into this new project. So things like that, the historical information and historical learnings are a, a massive improvement with better collaboration and they're a big asset in your organisation. What I thought was really interesting about what Nick was saying, in my world I talk to the community a lot, developers and you know, they're obviously the honey badgers of the world, uh, which I'm going to be saying a lot now. Um, but then also business leaders who are managing IT departments and the tech of businesses. And it, that where does the responsibility lie? Does the business need to brief the developer beyond the scope so they can foresee the business strategy and where it's going to go? Or do business leaders need to learn to speak tech? But I think Nikki gave some really great examples of how technical people can use language and talk in business cases to articulate that point better and vice versa. So I think that's really helpful. Yeah, I mean, it, it goes both ways. I mean, developers need, they need the context on why they're building what they're building. Um, but then also, you know, coming back, they need to talk in the language of the people in the product teams because they, they, they deal with metrics and business outcomes as well. So mm. um, it, 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 that's the whole reason behind putting those in because it is a, a common issue um, to bridge that kind of gap. And that's where kind of closing the feedback loop kind of ties it up because if you're struggling to get buy-in, uh, if you're struggling to get your the things you care about on the right, you're probably just not speaking the right language to the people in the business uh, in order to get the buy-in. So 
once you've got the tools set up and the culture um, and you know how you can kind of innovate quickly with, within your team, um, getting the buy-in from the rest of the business, not only will this accelerate your career, um, it'll also make you kind of the hero of the organization because, um, you know, the Jack or the Jill of the development team is the one who's pushed us into the, the, the new realm of what we can do and now we can ship faster and the software quality has improved and look at the error chart, you know, it's gone way down off applications much faster, but this doesn't happen overnight. You know, you have to, you have to get the buy-in of the whole business to kind of make this happen. That'd be interesting. So we're up to our, we're right on track in the terms of the time. So I know we had a couple of questions that were emailed through, but how's it looking for questions over there, Eliza? Well, I promised Keith I'd ask his question. Keith wants to know, what do you do about tool overload? So there's a new tool every week. They all do really specific things. Do you see consolidation coming into some areas or how do you assess? Yeah, so so that's the, the chaos and control bit that I talked about. And it's not it's not just around um, having having control on on aligned outcomes. It's also tools. And there's actually quite a few of our customers that have re this has really resonated well. They want to give flexibility to take decision to for developers to make decisions about tools they want but they want control so it's it's like you have to find a happy medium there and you're right um tools change in organizations like 70 percent of tools change every 12 months um but having having a having an agreement on how closely or openly you allow that to happen is the only real way to control it even in that space, it's changed massively in five or ten years, hasn't yeah. it? The, the tech stack is so varied now. You know, I mean, we see department. we see it a lot. We're we're effectively at the heart of a lot of development because we're we're most of the source. I mean, it's not just it's not GitHub, but it's Git in general. So there's lots of tools. When somebody brings a new tool to market, it integrates with with GitHub, and so everyone plays with GitHub and their new tool as well. Um, it's it's not an easy one, but again, having having a reasonable, um, a reasonable set on those boundaries to give you some flexibility for developers that want to try new stuff. Because the reality is some of those tools might be really successful for your organization. So you don't want to discount them just because there's a lot of them. You just want to control how many you bring in and also rationalization. If it's like we have five tools that deliver this same functionality, then you really need to look at what the difference is with a new one as well. It's very easy to go shiny new thing. We usually go in, you know, cycles of certainly the companies I've worked for is every 12 or so months, you know, you, you do a big cull yeah. on what ones aren't as useful because you do have to have an appetite for new tools because yeah. the ones that do kind of break through or do kind of, you know, prove to be valuable, you actually almost can't live without them mm. at a certain point. You know? It's true. Uh, you know, just uh, on, on a, a potential way to manage that outside of your ha having having drivers that are going to put pressure on production. You know, GitHub, if people are using enterprise or enterprise cloud, you can run up instances to test new tools to you know test the viability of them bringing value to your to your environment as well without actually having to introduce them in. Cool. Um, another. Tactical question, what are some good open source dashboard tools you could recommend? Uh, I don't really know too much about the open source ones. Um, I mean, we, we use our own internal Raygun um, dashboards at the, the product here, but um, I, hear, I hear Grafana come, a lot, uh, come up a lot with uh, our customers. Um, and our marketing team uses a tool called Gecko Board as well, which is, is not open source, but um, that's also probably um, not quite the tool for developers, but um, Grafana is just one that seems to come up a lot with, with customers, but we have our own dashboarding functionality within Raygun, so I, I don't really know any open source ones. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not that familiar with them. We're happy to take that offline and come back with any recommendations. Our, our support team um, are very much across a lot of these tools. What I will say is what, um, comes up quite often is that people don't realize that the API into GitHub is extremely open. So if you have dashboards that you're using within your organization and what you're looking for is access to data that you want to analyze and have presented, it may well be available already and you can build it into something that you're currently using. It's, it's definitely an area of focus for GitHub 
from a product perspective to deliver a better dashboard and insight experience for organizations and developers. Uh, another question here, one from Ben, how can we put, I think Nick, this would be a good one for you. How can we put some ROI metrics on the ideas and new features to get that buy-in where there's no, no time to experience the features? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a good question. So the way we've done it internally, and that's the only kind of experience I can speak to, is um, we, we have our product roadmap, but then we've actually added fields alongside the work to say, rank the customer impact, the development uh, time involved, and all these kind of criteria um, that sit alongside. So we can actually rank them based on the business impact and the customer impact and the development time that's going to take. Um, and we can kind of evaluate them side by side um, because you're never going to actually know until you put the product live mm -hmm. um, or the feature live. But if you can kind of talk to the impact that that particular feature or um, new product's going to have on the organization, uh, you'll be able to rank them against each other. So I would say add in some kind of extra, extra supporting information or rankings for everything you want to build so that, People know if we actually build this, it's going to have quite a big impact on our revenue or you know, usability. And I think I think if it's um, if it's within the boundaries of your of your uh, appetite for risk, have a good early access program. You know, have your have your trusted advisors inputting into into product and feature as well. GitHub does that. Uh, we've recently gone through early access programs for new features like. Uh, like actions, and it's a really, really meaningful feedback process for us to make sure that we can uh, make the pro product as relevant as possible as what people are looking to achieve. Another question here about making the deck available. I assume absolutely. Yeah, for sure. We'll email out the deck and, and the, um, the full reporting as well. They're just after the flash pictures of us. Uh, so you can, yeah. The, the line. Oh, this does. No. Yeah, yeah, the line. <laughs> I'm kidding, sorry. <laughs> Should we go to email for a couple more? Yeah, I've got one here. So what are some tangible steps I can take to speed up my time to ship without increasing the risk? Uh, good question. Um, well, I guess like kind of playing within the realms of what you've already got set up, right? So, so the instant one for me, well, how, can, how can I make the build server times actually less, you know? Um, you can actually do things to speed up your build times. Um, you can upgrade servers and things like that. Um, but, you know, going out and buying new tools and stuff is just really not going to help you at that stage. You know, you need to, you need to take a look at um, what you've already got, how, how you can optimize it. Um, how can you optimize the process of um, shipping code and can reduce how, how many bugs get introduced by doing QA uh, with your teams. Um, but it's going to be a real kind of um, case by case basis. Um, Sorry. Yeah, I, I was going to say from a GitHub perspective, one of the things that I hear frequently from our technical people talking to customers is get comfortable, and this is a culture change, but get comfortable with creating early pull requests. So, you know, if you've got something you're working on, get eyes on it fast, because assume that if you can get through coming up with an outcome with two eyes, if you have 100, 100 eyes on it, you're going to get there a lot faster. Is, you know, like, are everyone moving to DevOps in terms of having all the resources, in, you know, within that same team to be able to kind of manage that kind of quality and put it out there quicker? Yeah, I, well, I think, I think DevOps is, is a, a marriage between the, the tool side and the developer side um, to, to make it faster. But I think what people assume is that DevOps will fix problems. And DevOps doesn't fix problems. Cultural change fixes problems. DevOps supports a better mechanism to, to run at speed, but it's it's really the culture and the people that are gonna adopt that. So it's really, really important, but what we have seen, and we actually saw this a lot in the APAC region when GitHub started to engage more with the community down here, we saw that having a DevOps strategy did not transform the, the speed at which you could ship. Having a cultural change program that allowed people to get the best out of the tool set that they were putting on that was supporting that DevOps was much more, um, much more uh, effective and successful. Cool. So we've got one more question. Um, how do you find the balance between control and innovation? And you kind of spoke to the guardrails. It's, it's really about understanding your market. Like I said, at the end of the day, if you're falling behind, if your competitors are bringing out product ahead of you, 
and you're, you know, you're, you're becoming less relevant to your audience, your rails are probably too close together. If you've got trust issues with your product because of failures or stability or inconsistencies, then your rails are too open. So what you've really got to do, and actually this kind of ties back into having a really good early access program as well. Because if you're running an early access program, you're getting feedback before you hit production. Don't underestimate the importance and the value of the feedback from your audience as part of your, as part of your developer ecosystem. Um, there's no hard and fast rule though. There is no, you should do it this way. Every organization is gonna be different. Uh, it, working closely with business and developer to find the happy ground is what you have to do. Otherwise, you're gonna to continue to find problems. But try and, try and map it back to your, 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 um, your, your product success and outcomes and appetite in the market. Oh, that's certainly a, a key theme. Um, any other final, final points, guys, before you wrap this thing up? Not, not for me. I just hope that there was something in there for everybody that can, they can take at least one point away, make some kind of change in their organization to um, improve. Um, there's no kind of quick fix. Um, it's just going to take um, that kind of culture shift, communication shift, and then putting the right tools and processes in place to actually actually get there eventually. But you're not going to get there overnight, and there's no silver bullet. I'd just like to say thank you to the Raygun team for inviting GitHub to be part of it. I think it's great. It's it's great to be able to to sit down with with local innovators and actually have a discussion about our industry and what it means to an audience. So appreciate it and appreciate everyone's time. No worries. And and you know one thing I. You know, when I talk to customers and I always ask kind of how their workflow has changed and I used to say five years and I'd say night and day and I've changed that to three years and they still say night and day. They almost can't believe how they used to do it three years ago. So, I mean, people shouldn't feel overwhelmed about the, the speed of change. It's almost an opportunity um, to kind of, no one has it, has it sussed, you know, it's kind of, you're constantly learning, there's constantly new tools, there's constantly new ways to innovate and, and, and introduce exciting new features and leverage tools in your team and whatnot. So it's just having that appetite and, and kind of, and comparing yourself to the best in the world, actually, you know, mm -hmm. to remain competitive. Mm -hmm. And I, I loved your point around developers being at the center of this innovation and it, and it ends up, you know, for all these companies that are traditionally not technical companies, it's actually the developers and the product team that are driving that innovation and driving that competitive advantage. So you're in the power seat. Um, totally. So, you know, it's, it's a really exciting place to be. All righty, guys, we're going to awesome. wrap it up. Cheers, Eliza. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll, we'll choose the best questions and send out some swag, so we'll be in touch. Um, but thanks so much for everyone to joining, for joining us today, uh, and we'll, we'll send you the recordings and the slides later on. See you in the next one. See you later. And that should be done.